Welcome to the heart of the matter. It's our pleasure to bring you another episode and today we have a special guest. She is Mrs. Chioma Isiadinso. She is the uh, founder of Expatus, which is a personal branding and education or admission uh, company. Now, we're, we're looking to talk specially to the youth today because Chioma um, it, it can help the youth help young people get uh, into education uh, and, and so on and so forth. Now, I wanted to tell you all about yourself. Chema, how did you get into the, the area of personal branding uh, to help people with their admission into universities? Sure. Thank you, Pastor, for having me on your show. You're welcome. I'll tell you this. I, when I was growing up, I thought I was going to be an actress, you okay. know, of all things. My dad was a professor of English at UNN. My mom was a high school principal. But... It wasn't until I took my first psychology class in high school in America that I discovered psychology and the light bulb went off. So I moved away from theatre to psychology. So I knew that whatever I did with my life ultimately would be something that was about people, about helping them access education. I was very fortunate to have had access to good quality education and so I've spent most of my life trying to help create greater access to young people to get into their schools of their dreams. And I know you're being modest when you say good quality education. You went to Harvard. My husband went to Harvard. Your, your husband went to Harvard, but you worked in Harvard. Yes, I did. Okay, so, so tell us, what did that Harvard experience do for you um, in, in setting you on this course? You know, that's a great question. It, for me, it was interesting to work um, in the inner sanctum, so to speak, of, of the admissions board at Harvard, and to see 10,000 applicants come through the door, and often only 10% will be accepted. So 9,000 of them will be rejected. Mm -hmm. And I started to pay close attention mm -hmm. to who were the people who were getting the yes offers, and who were the people who were getting the no yeah. offers. And it wasn't always just people who were so smart that got in. There were a lot of very smart people who did not get admitted. Mm -hmm. And then there were people who were okay in terms of being intelligent. They had a decent academic story, mm -hmm. but they had something else. They told an extra story. That's where the personal branding comes in. Okay, so this is personal branding. It's about every individual is unique, mm -hmm. has a unique personality, has something unique to offer yes. the world. And so what you are doing is helping that person Identify them. Am I right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Tell and, us more. Okay. The, the way we do that actually is that we help our clients to look inwards, to do introspection. Most okay. people don't go through their lives thinking, what it is, what, you know, what drives me, what is my passion, what are my goals, uh, what skills am I naturally good at? And so, with our clients, we spend time helping them look inwards to figure out what the answers are to these questions. And it's pulling out those stories and putting it together in a language that admissions people at the leading schools in America and England are used to seeing, what they're looking for, so they can rise above their competition. I understand that every, every admission is accompanied with essays. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you're writing about yourself, who you are, and all that, so you can help people develop that. Exactly, exactly. Now, so Expatus mm -hmm. is about getting people into education. What else does Expatus do? So not only do we help people to get into um, universities, we also help older people who are working in careers and they want a career change. We help them to go and do executive programs um, around the globe. We also do ac create access for scholarships because we think that there should be a level playing field. The, where, you know, your birth lottery should not determine how far you go in life. And there are a lot of uh, scholarships that are out there and a lot of different educational models that exist. For instance, there's a, a university called the University of the People, started by an Israeli businessman. And it's relatively new, and the cost of going to this university, it's, it's an online university, everything okay. is done online but with sensitivity to the emerging markets where there's very low um, internet uh, speed. And so because of that, anyone who uh, wants to get an education in computer science and business can, uh, can apply. There are no tests to get in, you know, and if you get into the University of the People, for every test that you have, you're paying like $50. $50. So compared to 
$250,000 education price tag in America, that's almost nothing. Okay. You did say um, that you also help people who are working already in a career um, rebrand, as it were, yes. so they can get another job. And, and, and while we were off air before we came on air, yes. we were talking about the fact that it is no longer, I don't want to use the word fashionable, to, to start with one employer, work for 30 years and then collect a pension. Why is it that people uh, change jobs so frequently? Right. I think it's a, a variety of different things. Uh, opportunities are great. You know, individuals are realizing that they have a lot of options. I also think that employers, to a large extent, don't have the same level of loyalty as they used to have in the 50s, 60s, where you sort of, you started at a firm, they trained you, you stayed there for 20, 30 years, you retired, you had a pension. These days, you know, people, companies are looking for less expensive labor. Where can they get the labor? Where can they get the quality? So individuals who are working have to look at themselves as mm -hmm. CEO of, them, of their lives, of their own mm -hmm. corporation, whether they have a formal business or not. And so as a CEO of your company, you're responsible for the bottom line. How much investment are you going to make in yourself? But also, how are you going to navigate your career? What skills? At the end of the day, employers are looking for skills. They want people who can actually deliver and do the job. In time past, now, yeah. now because maybe I'm a bit old school, in time past, if somebody sent me an application and I noticed that they did two years here, three years there, mm -hmm. I'd say this person is not stable. Right. They keep on changing jobs and I'll probably on that basis reject that person. Right. But you're saying today that's not the way it goes. There has to be a cohesive story. So there's a balancing act in anything. So when I see a young person who has only worked for 18 months at one firm, then they jumped and went to another firm, and they're there six months and they're talking about leaving, that's a no-no. So that's not what we're talking about. On the other hand, if you have somebody who went into an investment banking environment as an analyst, for instance, and they worked there for two years, after two years, the option is to either become an associate if you're promoted, or you go get an MBA. So in an environment like that, you, you, know, you see people do a couple of years and then maybe another couple of years elsewhere and then they'll go get an MBA. Less than two years, I think you raise all sorts of red flags about you. But it's not unusual, especially when people are starting their career, to have shorter periods of time versus you know, back at your, during your, your time. Yeah. We're going to take a break now, but sure. when we come back, I want to know what makes you, what, what is your driving passion? So stay tuned, viewers. We'll be back with Shoma in a moment. Watch your favorite Heart of the Matter episodes online at www.theheartofthematter.tv. Also, check out exciting behind-the-scenes photos. Leave your comments and like us on Facebook. My name is Omilola Oshikoya. I'm a UK certified life coach a personal and business finance coach with a background in investment banking. My name is Edu G. Russell. I am a business analyst and I work in a blue chip company. What, what would I need to do to begin to prepare myself for an executive MBA? Because I'd like to um, do an executive MBA in the near future. So I'd like to know what I need to do now to begin to prepare myself. Or what are the things that uh, would be required of me? Sure. I think the first thing is to put a timeline behind it. So if you know that you want to go and get your MBA in a couple of years, then you mark the time in terms of when you want to go and then work backwards. There are several things you need to do. The first is take the GMAT or the GRE. Most executive MBA programs accept either of the two. And it's very important that you actually take the time to study for it and make sure you do well. And then of course, the work experience is obviously very important. So you need to make sure that your um, supervisors know about your dream and that they support you. Because ultimately, you need to get a recommendation letter for them. So once you get these two things out of the way, the rest of it really is making sure that you're demonstrating leadership in your current role. And even beyond that, making sure you have some extracurricular involvement that shows that you're a leader, even outside of your work environment. As, a, as an undergraduate, why do I need to have an MBA? Now I'm aware of the current economic situation in which many corporations will not hire you without an MBA. 
But as you mean, I find myself in a position where I have clear goals about who I am and where I want to be. What would you, what would you advise me to consider? You raise a really good question. I mean, what I tell young people is, it's, it, it's, it shouldn't be a foregone conclusion that you're going to get an MBA or go get a master's degree. It should be something that you're, you've thought long and hard about, and it's a decision you're making for yourself, and not because your mother wants you to get a, go get a master's degree, or you know, everybody around you is getting a degree, so you feel like, ah, I should go and sign up and go and do that. That's not really the, the reason you should go do a master's. You should spend some time giving thought to what you want to do long term. I always uh, advise young people to start with the goal in mind. So let's say, for, for instance, you want to be an entrepreneur. You want to start your own company. I know entrepreneurs who are amazingly successful who don't have an MBA. And there are also entrepreneurs who have an MBA, and they um, say that the MBA was a vital part of their success. So my advice to you is to really think long and hard about what it is you want to do. What are the skills that you're going to need for that particular job so that you can be, you can be successful with it? Are they skills that you lack? And would an MBA help you get those skills? Is it a network that you want? You know, a lot of people who go to business school or to graduate school, they do it not just for the theoretical knowledge, they do it also for the network that they would establish when, while they're at school. So start with the end goal, look at what you're missing right now in your toolkit, and then ask yourself whether an MBA is the absolute way to get it. Are there any um, scholarships or loans out there for international students? Because I'm assuming that if you're an American um, citizen, you have access to certain grants and loans. But as an international student, are there any loans or grants that one can look to if funds are an issue? Sure. It's interesting, there are a lot of scholarships that exist. And I'm, I'm also struck by how a lot of people don't know about them. I'll give you an example. The MasterCard Foundation has put aside uh, half a billion dollars just for Africa. Half a billion dollars. And it's not just for one particular discipline, it cuts across disciplines. So anyone who is smart, who wants to go and further their education, that's a resource that's available to them. and it's, solely for Africans who want to go abroad to get an education. That's just one of many scholarships. You know, Seven Up has a scholarship for students who have been admitted to Harvard. I think they give it to one or two students each year. And it's a full ride. So that's just one option. The other option is that, um, depending on the school, if you're looking at a PhD program, for instance, PhD programs are usually fully funded. If a school admits you, admits you to a PhD program, they will fund it for four to five years for your tuition, room and board, and they'll give you a stipend, okay? At the master's level, it's a bit different. Not all master's programs would, uh, would give you access to scholarships um, if you're not a US citizen, but there are many who do. Um, so a lot of the top schools in America and the top European and UK schools, they'll give you scholarships, or they'll give you access to uh, loans that you can qualify for, even if you're not an American citizen. And think about it, the, the return on the investment is quite huge. You're talking about somebody who's making $20,000 or significantly less, getting an MBA at a top school, and the starting salary often is between eighty dollars to $100,000. Do the math. You know, if the MBA costs 100 and something thousand, in two to three years, they would have paid off that tuition. My question is um, to the average Nigerian who's trying to work his way up to the top yeah. and um, the econ as we know what the economic situation is right now he finds himself in a monotonous job mm -hmm. and he's trying to work his way up there right. what would you advise this person to do you ask a really good question we all know people who are stuck or who feel stuck in their jobs they hate their jobs every day and they just go and they feel like they're just basically um, threading water but, you know and my advice basically is to say to them this too shall pass you know, anyone you see who's been extremely successful, they've all had a job that they hated. That was a job, a job that they thought, oh my gosh, I woke up, took my brain, left it at home and came to work. I'm not using my brain, I'm not using my God-given talent, etc. So it's a reality. What I say is, okay, you acknowledge that this is not where you're, you're meant to be. You're bigger than this, you're greater than this, your destiny is more than this. Then what do you do? Do you stay arrogant? Do you have a bad attitude, etc.? Or do you humble yourself 
right? And you say, okay, this is just for now. I'll bring a spirit of excellence to anything I do. So even while I'm doing this grunt job, I will do it, but with a spirit of excellence. I'll be the best cleaner in this place. I'll be the best coffee server or whatever the job is. That's one thing. And then have a plan. You know, if you don't have a plan, then you're planning to fail for sure. So what is your plan? If you ask a lot of young people what are their plans, they often sort of say, well, I plan to, some vague answer. A plan has to be very specific. You have to have timeline attached to it. You know, so if I asked you, in two years, what do you plan to achieve? You know, you, you plan to go to business school. So you say to me, in two years, I should be admitted and actually finishing my first year at the best business school in the country. That's a goal. Then work backwards. What is it going to take for you to accomplish those, those plans? Write it down. Look for resources of people who can help you to achieve that. And then um, work your plan. Check it and revise it as needed. Okay. Um, as a mother of two, um, I have a dream. I want my kids to go to the top Ivy League schools in the world. And I know it's not just about academics. So what do I need to do to begin to prepare them now, even at an early age, at age four, age seven? What, what, I, what do I need to begin to do now to prepare them for the competition out there? Right. You said the operative word, competition, out there. If you're looking at Ivy League schools, you know, schools like Harvard, they get 35,000 applications. They're going to accept about 2,000. That means 33,000 people are going to be rejected. That's the size of a small town. That's huge. So how do we prepare our kids so that our kids would be competitive with these kinds of schools, the Oxfords, the Cambridge of, of, of the world? The first thing is you've got to start early. You know? And by that I mean you have to be like what um, Amy Shua, who wrote the book, uh, The Battle Hymn of a Tiger Mom. She's an Asian American who's a professor at Yale, Yale Law School. And she wrote her, her biography about how she trained her kids to play piano from when they were four or five years old. And at certain points, they wanted to quit. But it's not an option. It's not, quitting is not an option. You know, it's about getting your kids involved in activities that they truly care about. Don't impose on them your dreams. I wanted to be a concert violinist, so you will be a concert violinist. It doesn't work. Focus on who they are, spend time to get there, to know them, and then cultivate and nurture their God-given talent. And give them exposure so they can actually elevate and build skills. So if let's say, for example, you have a daughter who's uh, very artistic, make sure that she is in an art club. Find out if they have community clubs, are there competitions that she can, she can be entered for. When you go on holidays, where can you um, expose her so that she can get uh, more access to other artists who have been very successful. Just nurture the talent you have in your children, help them to elevate, help them to actually create uh, impact in those areas. They're building a resume. Their competition is building a resume from when they are four or five years old. So if you wait till when they're a year before they're going to apply, the story has already been told. And that's to a large extent why many applicants are rejected because they're starting way too late in the process. Welcome back to the Heart of the Matter, where we're talking with Mrs. Chioma Isiadinso um, about her uh, work, which, which is expressed through the company Expartus. And just before we went uh, on a break, I asked her about her passion. You know, what makes you get out of bed in the morning to go chase students and help them? What is it? Yeah, it's, it's a fundamental belief that there is incredible you know, power in all of us, potential power that God puts in each of, each of us, that if we can help that person access education, access an educational environment, they will be able to get the training, the knowledge, the network that will help propel them to the next level. I look at my dad, my late dad, for instance, he was the son of farmers. He didn't, you know, his parents didn't even, even finish third grade, you know, but because he got access to a scholarship, he got to do a PhD at Cambridge. That would never happen. And so for me, when I wake up every day, I think about how education can transform lives. And I, I feel very blessed to have a, an opportunity to help you know, in a small way to, to empower students. Okay, now is there any particular a type of person you're looking to help? I mean, does a person have to be 
of a certain level of intelligence or education before they should bother getting in touch with expertise? Intelligence is always a relative thing. I mean, there's seven types of intelligence, right? Um, for, for us, we specialize in the top schools, basically. Okay. So often the clients who come to us are coming to us because they know that the schools they are targeting reject 90% of the applicants. Okay. So they hire us because they want to be one of the 10% to get in. Okay. So in a sense, um, a lot of people who come to us are already pre-selected. However, we do, I have a charity that I do called Clothes for Life. I, so I'm, as part of that, we also do educational programs to okay. empower people. Everybody's not going to go to university. Everybody's not going to go to Harvard. You know, there are going to be people who need some mentorship and some polishing so they'll be able to get into an administrative role in, a, in an office, things like that. So we also offer that to clients. Okay, so, so now back to the guy who wants to go to Harvard. Mm -hmm. Does he have to have got a, a first class or a 2-1 to be able to, to come to you? I mean, is it a no-no if he ended up with a third class degree? It's a no-no. If they're trying to go to Harvard, yeah. yes. If, if, if you've got a third class degree or the equivalent um, and you're applying to schools like Harvard, Stanford, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, you just took to $200 and threw it down the toilet. Yeah. But if you've got a 2-1 or a 2-2? Two -two? Aim for a 2-1. The more selective the schools are, the, the higher the expectations, because it's a competition game, it's a supply and demand issue. If you have a 2-2, two -two, it's not impossible, but unless, you must have a rock star, what we call walks on water story, uh, to, you know, to, to be able to get into Harvard with a 2-2. Two -two. It's not impossible, but there has to be something else behind your story. Maybe someone who grew up homeless, you know, who lived under a bridge. There has to be some personal story that you overcame and completely changed and di then didn't s just feel sorry for yourself, you started a, a non-profit. You know, we need to get more Nigerians doing extracurricular activities, okay. doing community service and okay. helping so, people. So I was just going to ask about that. Sure. What other criteria, okay. apart from their academic education, mm -hmm. what other things do you think um, a, a potential uh, uh, applicant sure. requires? Sure. So it's something we call the three C's of leadership. So it's college lead. So for the ones who are applying to graduate school, for instance, they have to have a track record of having served in a leadership role, okay. whether it's a, uh, a nonprofit that they are part of, or it's something they started. It doesn't, it doesn't even matter how small. I tell, I tell Nigerian parents, get your kids out. They can't be so sheltered, you know, and they're sort of chauffeured from one place to another. They have to see the need in the, in the community and get them involved. If there's soccer or football that they love, why don't they start a uh, be part of a football league, you know, it, for kids who are coming from a very poor background? Of course with supervision, but that child can then have a, some kind of a unique edge. Um, so the three C's of leadership is college leadership, it's, um, it's community leadership, so even, so you do yeah, something in, your community. in your community, in your church even, step up, raise your hand, say, can I help with this? You know, and as you do that, you'll be given more responsibility. And with responsibility comes impact and track record. And then finally, it's career leadership. So you can't say, well, they didn't give me a chance to do anything. That's not the kind of student that schools such as Harvard or London Business School or, or programs like that. They're looking for people who seize opportunities. This doesn't exist. Let's help to create that. Okay. But you also help undergraduates or people yes. who are trying to go into university mm -hmm. to get their first degree. Yes. What, what are the criteria they should have? Okay, so to talk about criteria, Pastor, I would say this. The most important criteria is the academic story. And the, student, the, the schools want to see consistency. They want to see that a child has taken a rigorous curriculum and that they have done very well. Um, if the grades are up and down, that's a major problem. If they had a, a slow start, so they maybe struggled in uh, uh, JSS 1, but then got, you know, got themselves together and then did well GSS 2, GSS 3 and onwards, they're going to be more attractive to a school. So it's the academic foundation is the most important thing. The next thing is the SAT or ACT um, in the case of American schools. For UK, you have to do very well in your predictive uh, O-level performance so that you can, they can accept you for, um, for top UK schools. So those are the, the, the core ones. But then what I tell parents is it's now. I have a seven-year-old and he plays chess. He started playing chess in London at about age four. 
for fun, but then when we put him in um, kindergarten, he joined the chess club at school. And then from there, the teacher said, why don't you put him in the Wimbledon tournament circuit? Okay. So we put him in there. So he did about 10, 10 tournaments before we moved to Nigeria, okay. to, uh, a bit of, uh, under two years ago. When I moved to Nigeria, I couldn't find anywhere to put him into. So I started a chess academy. Okay. So I found other little kids who are seven years old. We, the youngest we have is a four-year-old. And he's learned how to play chess. And I tell the parents, if they start at age six, seven, eight, find something they love. It doesn't have to be chess. It could be anything. I bet your son is uh, pretty good at chess now and can he's, beat. He's good. He's good. But this, you know, with chess, it's, it's, it's what Malcolm Gladwell talks about, 10,000 hours in his book, Outliers. We have to it's, stick with it. He has to put in more hours. And, you know, and the more time they spend, the better they will get in anything. For any child, you know, whether it's music or swimming, I advise Nigerian parents to stick with it. Don't have your child doing 50 different things. They'll be master of none. Okay. Now, you've talked about parents. Yes. Because about, apart from what the child has, what can the parents do to help a child get into? Because, yeah. you know, paying the fee is, is, is not... You've got to get the opportunity to pay the fee. Yes. So what can a parent do to help the child get into these... Um, top universities. Sure. The most important thing a parent has to do is to invest time. Spend time with your child. Find out what he or she likes. You have to f help the child to understand what their innate talents are. And then give them every opportunity. And when the opportunity doesn't exist, create one. Push the envelope. It's, it's, it's difficult to get up on Saturday mornings and drive your child here and there and for the, swim, the swimming meet. It's a sacrifice. But what you're doing is you're investing into that child's long-term future. And so it's about starting early, knowing what your child likes. And if you don't know, taking time to exp expose them to different things and then being alongside them to then focus. Great. Uh, it's, it's been wonderful talking to you, Shioma, and um, we do look forward to having another opportunity to be able to chat with you some more and see how we can help okay. more more youth okay. um, so it's 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 been great having you on the heart of the matter viewers i hope you've enjoyed this episode of the heart of the matter and we look forward to seeing you again next week when we have another episode until then stay blessed mm -hmm.